Hello friends, so I'm doing something a little bit different today. For a while I've been aware that a lot of the Nancy Drew games are originally based on books, and I've always been interested to see how the two compare. And the other night, on a whim, I bought... this. So, uh, here we are! This is the book the very first Nancy Drew game, Secrets Can Kill, is based on. I already know it's going to be good because there's a big tagline on the back that says, Nancy Drew goes back to high school, but this time, the curriculum is murder! <laughs> Secrets Can Kill is the first book in the Nancy Drew Files series, which updates Nancy Drew to be mature and modern. And by modern, I mean the 1980s. There's um, an ad in the back of this book for a sweepstakes. I could win a Panasonic RX920 AC battery portable AM FN stereo radio cassette recorders with mechanical pause control bracket boom boxes, close bracket, or even, if I'm lucky, a Panasonic SG-X7 stereo music system with receiver, cassette deck, turntable, and two speakers! Before I go any further, please be aware this video will contain spoilers for Secrets Can Kill, Secrets Can Kill Remastered, and Alibi and Ashes. Threw your curveball with that last one, didn't I? <laughs> I am so ready to dive into this book, so let's crack open this case file. We start off with Nancy trying on clothes she bought at the mall during an epic shopping spree with Bess and George, and Bess and George are described in a very similar way to how they are described in the original Nancy Drew books, if you're familiar with those. Blonde-haired Bess was bubbly and easygoing, and always on the lookout for two things, a good diet and a great date. So far, she hadn't found either. She was constantly trying to lose five pounds, and she fell in and out of love every other month. Please, I'm begging you, give Bess some more characteristics than this! George, with curly dark hair and a shy smile, was quiet, with a dry sense of humor, and the beautifully toned body of an athlete. George liked boys as much as Bess did! George isn't gay, guys. She's definitely not gay. George? N not gay. Definitely not. No. Well, maybe George isn't, but I certainly am. This description, curly dark hair, a dry sense of humor, beautifully toned body? Are you kidding me? <laughs> We also get a description of Nancy. Nancy studied herself in the mirror. She liked what she saw. The tight jeans looked great on her long, slim legs, and the green sweater complemented her strawberry blonde hair. Self-love! We love to see it! Also, please note the color of her hair. Later on, they explicitly describe her as a redhead. I guess the cover artist just didn't get the memo? We also learn about the case Nancy's been hired to investigate. She'll be posing as a new student at Bedford High School, looking into a pretty minor mischief spree. Some lockers are broken into, and there are some files and video equipment missing from the school. Nothing that major, honestly. I don't really know why they felt the need to hire a private detective. But I guess there wouldn't be a story if they didn't. Already there's differences between the book and the game, you've probably noticed. It isn't set in Florida at Paseo Del Mar High School, but instead at a town that's within driving distance of Nancy's hometown of River Heights. The murder, the kill in Secrets Can Kill, hasn't even happened yet. Honestly, I wish the game had done this. Secrets Can Kill is possibly the shortest Nancy game in the series, and I think the additional content would really add a lot to it and add further intrigue to the story. It would also give us more time to familiarize ourselves with the different students who are later suspected of murdering Jake. But maybe they didn't want to place the emotional burden of being unable to prevent a murder onto the backs of ten-year-old children. Right now, Nancy said to her two friends, the hardest part of this case is deciding what to wear. That outfit, definitely, Bess said. You'll make the guys absolutely drool. That's all she needs, George joked. A bunch of freshmen following her around like underage puppies. Oh yeah, have you seen the captain of the Bedford football team? Bess rolled her eyes. They don't call him Hunk Hogan for nothing. Hunk Hogan? His name is Hulk Hogan! <laughs> Shut up! 
I'm guessing this is the character Hulk is based on. I thought Hulk was a legendary name, but Hunk Hogan? The conversation is interrupted when Nancy receives a mysterious package which contains an unmarked videotape. The three girls start watching it and it's footage of their trip to the mall, so there's just like some creepy stalker following them around, videotaping them eating hot dogs and stuff, which is super creepy. Bess has this to say about it. It's true. The camera does add 10 pounds. You're making jokes. This is such a creepy invasion of privacy and you're making jokes. Then a high-pitched, hideously shrieking voice invaded the Drew's cozy den. Stick with shopping, Nancy Drew. It's a lot safer than snooping at Bedford High. Sorry, I didn't do the voice. I, I thought you might not want a high-pitched, hideously shrieking voice to invade your home. Or wherever you happen to be watching this video right now. So even though her cover is blown, before she's even started investigating, Nancy just heads right off to school the next morning. And remember when Nancy had a blue roadster? Well, now she has a red Mustang. Apparently she's really into cars. Like, what do they call that? Gearhead? Petrolhead? I don't know, I don't even have my full driver's license. <laughs> she makes sure to check out the new Mustang GT convertible on her way to school at the Ford dealership. We also get a description of Bedford. Bedford was beautiful, small, but with large homes surrounded by lush lawns. And, no doubt, swimming pools tucked away in the back somewhere. On the outskirts of town, along the road to the high school, Nancy passed several houses that could only be described as mansions. Bedford was obviously a place where a lot of rich people lived, Nancy thought. <laughs> Bedford? More like bourgeoisie for <laughs> Nancy stops at a traffic light right next to a Porsche 911 or 911, and of course she has to admire it because she's a total gasoline head. Nancy glanced over admiring the car and its owner gently revved the engine. The powerful motor gave a soft, throaty rumble, then another. Nancy smiled at the obvious come on and lifted her gaze to the driver. Why is this scene so erotic? <laughs> the guy in the Porsche was one of the most gorgeous boys Nancy had ever seen. He gave Nancy a playful grin and revved the engine once more. Suddenly Nancy was wide awake. She grinned back and fluttered the glass pedal on the Mustang. Two can play at this game, she thought. Out of the corner of her eye, Nancy saw the turn arrow change to green. Still looking at the boy, she smoothly shifted gears. Then she peeled out ahead of the Porsche, swinging wide into his lane so that he had to follow her all the way down Bedford Road. She was definitely back in high school. D did Nancy True just compete in a street race? This isn't your grandma's, Nancy Drew! <laughs> Nancy meets with the principal of the school, called Principal Parton. Nancy took one look at Mr. Parton and decided to try to solve this case in record time. Mr. Parton looked like he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. For the sake of his health, she'd better work fast. He set Nancy up with an inside contact on this case. One of our seniors, a good student, completely trustworthy, and very popular president of the class, which is why I chose him. He can get you in touch with all the various crowds. And what do you know, it's the driver of the Porsche. Nancy Drew, the principal said, meet Daryl Gray. His eyes were the dark, dusky color of ripe blueberries, and they were rimmed with lashes that had to be at least half an inch long. Nancy had never seen eyes like that in her life. Some contact, she thought. <laughs> Is this your man? Is this your man? I'm glad the cover artist at least included Daryl's blueberry eyes. That's an essential element. You can't really see it, but trust me, they did. There is instant chemistry between Daryl and Nancy. Daryl's incredible eyes kept straying to Nancy each time Mr. Parton mentioned her name, and when the principal said something about showing Nancy the ropes, Daryl's mouth curved into a slow, teasing grin. Nancy couldn't help returning it. The attraction between them crackled like electricity. Nancy wondered how Mr. Parton could possibly miss the sparks, but he seemed oblivious to everything but his problem. Then the principal says, At this moment, Daryl is the only one, aside from me, who knows who you are and what you're doing here. The rest is in your hands. Nancy thinks, You're wrong, Mr. Parton. Somebody else knows who I am. And that's the person I have to find. Why doesn't she tell him? 
isn't that important? Or is she just worried that he'll die from a stress-induced heart attack? Nancy attends her classes, and after English, another student approaches her. I'm the editor of the Bedford Sentinel, and we're desperate for people to work on the paper. I noticed in English that you can at least read and write, she joked, and I bet you're going to be popular, so you'll have lots of good contacts. The Sentinel's fun. What do you think? Sounds about right. Nancy is immediately conned into doing a task which has absolutely nothing to do with her. Actually, this point ends up having absolutely no relevance to the plot because literally on the next page, Nancy decides to decline the offer because she knows she's not going to be at the school a very long time. But at least in the book, Nancy knows how to say no. Then it's lunchtime. Nancy entered the cafeteria. She looked around uncertainly. Where should she sit? We finally meet Connie Watson, who is very different from how she appears in the game. Nancy knew Connie's name because the teacher had called on her in French class. Connie's face had turned the color of a ripe tomato as she'd given her answer, and after class, Nancy had noticed that no one walked out of the room with her. Connie was slightly pudgy, but her eyes, though anxious and a little fearful, were friendly. She invites Nancy to eat lunch with her, and, and Nancy's like, I wish I could, but I've got to talk to the counselor about my schedule. I've been stuck with two gym classes. I'm just going to grab a yogurt and keep going. What Nancy really wanted was a chance to snoop around the video lab, so she isn't going to eat in the cafeteria. Literally less than a page ago, she was like, where am I going to sit in the cafeteria? This is so stressful. And now she's like, oh yeah, no, actually, I... Okay, okay, sure. Nancy bumps into Jake Webb. He's called Webb because he's like a spider and he entangles people in his web. Very subtle, get it? <laughs> Good move on her interactive's part to change his surname to Rogers. Jake immediately threatens Nancy. Maybe I ought to explain a few rules to you. Otherwise, you won't get very far at Bedford High. Smiling, he ran one finger lazily up her arm, across her neck, and to her lips. Excuse me, he does what? What the fuck? Rule one, Jake said softly. Keep your mouth shut about what you just heard. If you don't, you'll never learn rule two. Nancy was tempted to bite Jake's finger and see what happened. Oh my god, Nancy! <laughs> the longer Nancy stood there, the stronger the urge she had to push Jake Webb down the stairs. Nancy's the killer, case closed. Fortunately, before she can commit murder, Daryl shows up. Well, well, Jake scoffed. It's King Cool. I don't understand this nickname. Is it supposed to be insulting or like, how is that insulting? I don't understand. Jake leaves after calling Daryl King Cool a few more times. No one ever calls him this again, by the way. Not even Jake, even though he's called Daryl King Cool four times in one page. Daryl says Jake Webb's personality fits his name. He's just like a spider, waiting for a fly to come along. Oh. Maybe not so subtle. But most of us here aren't candidates for the psych award like he is. I'll prove it to you if you'll come to the dance with me this weekend. <laughs> Very smooth and not weird way to ask your girl on a date, bro. <laughs> Nancy accepts, though. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I guess she's just so entranced by his blueberry eyes. Nancy doesn't get a chance to go to the video lab because Connie comes and finds her again, which I'm pretty impressed <laughs> by her persistence. Nancy also notices that Connie's wearing a very nice gold bracelet. We briefly meet Hal, who doesn't have the backstory of being a Japanese exchange student in the book, but is still the resident smart cookie. And Nancy overhears a conversation between Hal and Jake, where Jake is telling Hal to write his essay for him. Then Nancy finally gets the opportunity to go to the video lab, but who does she find there but Daryl Gray? peering at a shelf of tapes, which is not at all suspicious. Nancy invites him for a drive in her Mustang, but oh no, when <laughs> driving down a steep slope, she realizes the brakes have been cut. She manages to stop the car in a ditch, but she smells something weird, and it isn't Daryl's axe body spray. That rock we went over? I think it cracked the gas tank. Daryl, the car could blow. It could blow any second. And then Daryl's door gets stuck, and when Nancy finally gets him out of the car, the car explodes. <laughs>
Naturally, this is the perfect time for a romantic moment. Feeling the heat of Daryl's breath against her cheek, Nancy hardly noticed her bruised knee and scratched arms. It seemed the most natural thing in the world for them to keep their arms around each other. When Daryl had first touched her two days before in the hallway, she wondered what his arms would feel like. Now she knew. They felt fabulous. But with that fabulous feeling came another feeling. Guilt. It wasn't Ned whose arms were holding her. It wasn't Ned whose lips she was feeling, nor Ned whose voice was murmuring her name. And hadn't she said just three days before that nobody could compete with Ned Nickerson? Oh yeah, there's a passage about Ned earlier, but I didn't read it out because it was boring. Well, maybe no one could in the long run, but at that moment, in the short run, Daryl Gray was doing a pretty good job of it. It was a dangerous moment emotionally, and Nancy knew she wasn't ready to deal with it. Before Daryl's lips reached hers again, she eased herself gently from his arms. Setting healthy boundaries! We love to see it! Nancy suspects that it was Jake who cut her brake cable, and plans to confront him at school the next day. She couldn't wait to see the look on his face when he saw that his gruesome plan hadn't worked, that she was alive, and ready to take him on, the creep! <laughs> wow, I can't believe he literally tried to murder you, Nancy! What a creep! Also, we learn that Nancy and Daryl kissed after he dropped her off at home, so, uh, so much for healthy boundaries, I guess. She gets to school the next day and the police are there. Could Daryl have called them? She didn't think so. He tried to talk her out of dealing with Jake at least ten times, but he'd never once suggested that she go to the police, which was a little strange when she thought about it. She didn't think about it for long, though. As soon as she got out of the car, she joined the nearest group of kids. What happened, she asked. What's going on? One of the girls turned to her, fear and excitement in her eyes. It's Jake Webb, she said breathlessly. He's been killed. This book does the very Nancy Drew thing of ending every chapter on a cliffhanger, of which I approve. It's like the literary equivalent of like a cartoon. Da, da, da! It's Jake Webb, she said breathlessly. He's been killed. <laughs> Apparently Jake fell down the stairs right next to the video lab. Nancy is my prime suspect. Nancy snoops in Jake's locker and uncovers some evidence. Wire cutters, a battery pack for a video camera, an article about Hunk Hogan getting injured while playing football, an SAT answer key, and Connie's gold bracelet. Then a voice behind her said, well, if it isn't Nancy Drew, girl detective, you always manage to be right in the swing of the nastiest things. It's Brenda Carlton! That's right, Brenda Carlton from Alibi and Ashes! What the heck? <laughs> oh my gosh! Brenda had delusions of being an investigative reporter for Today's Times, her daddy's award-winning newspaper. But as far as Nancy was concerned, the only things Brenda did well were wear clothes and mess up Nancy's investigations. Oh! Brenda threatens to blow Nancy's cover unless she fills her in in her investigation, but Nancy makes a deal with her where she'll tell her everything, but only after she concludes the case. As she watched Brenda stroll away, she promised herself that someday she was going to close that reporter's notebook for good. Yep. Nancy checks out the video lab again and finds it partially trashed, but pretty much immediately finds the only p important piece of evidence there, a blackmail videotape. The first person on the tape was Hunk Hogan. Nancy mostly calls Hunk Hogan Walt, which is his real name. I don't know why. He was sitting on a bench in what must have been the locker room. The star tackle reached into the duffel bag at his feet and took out a roll of white tape. Obviously in great pain, he began to wrap it around his ribcage, wincing the whole time. Nancy remembered the article in Jake's locker that told of Walt betting all his hopes for a football scholarship on the upcoming All-State game. From the look of him, he'd be lucky to get dressed for that game, much less play in it. Walt was hurt, but he'd hidden it from everyone except... Jake Webb. There's no steroids in this story. No steroid abuse, no steroid theft. I'm honestly just so confused about what Jake is blackmailing Hunk Hogan over. So he's injured, but he's hiding it so that no one else notices. 
So he's playing just as well as he probably normally would. I don't see why other people finding this out would be such a big deal. Football scouts would probably even be impressed. Next is a clip of Connie shoplifting her gold bracelet. I don't know how Jake knew she was about to shoplift in this moment, but apparently he has ESP when it comes to misdeeds. Then there's Hal coming out of the principal's office with the SAT answer key, and the tape appears to end there. It's the next morning. Daddy Drew has bought Nancy the Mustang GT convertible she wanted to replace her exploded car, although he supposedly expects her to pay him back with the insurance money, but she might just be saying that because she doesn't want Daryl to think she's a total daddy's girl. Nancy decides to confront her three prime suspects. She doesn't get much out of the two guys, but Connie breaks down. That bracelet wasn't the only thing I stole, she admitted. I took a sweater the first time and it was so easy and I decided to try for a jacket. Only that time I got caught. It's all in my school file. Jake said he knew all about my shoplifting record and that if he told anyone about the bracelet, I'd probably go to jail. And he was right! Was he? <laughs> I really don't think she'd go to jail for stealing a sweater, a jacket, and a bracelet. Especially because she's just a high school kid. But I get it, Connie. I have anxiety too. Daryl asks if he can see the videotape, and he and Nancy go back to her house to watch it and get very cozy on the sofa. And when I say very cozy, I mean very cozy. Nancy was acutely aware of Daryl's closeness in the darkened room. He brought his arm up and around Nancy's shoulder, his hand resting lightly on the back of her neck. By the time Connie was walking up the school steps, this is in the video by the way, <laughs> neither Daryl nor Nancy was watching. Their eyes were on each other. As if they both thought of it at the same time, they moved their heads closer together until their lips were touching. Nancy slid her hands up Daryl's arms, felt his thick blonde hair under her fingers, felt his lips press against hers. She could hear her heart pounding in her ears, and then suddenly she heard another sound. The doorbell. Cock blocked by Bess and George. To make things even more dramatic, Nancy gets a phone call from Ned and learns that he's coming to stay at River Heights this very weekend. The same weekend as the dance. The dance she's attending with Daryl. In the meantime, the blackmail tape has continued to play uninterrupted on the VCR. And at the end of the tape is a clip of Daryl Gray. <laughs> Actually, it's multiple clips. Jake should have had a career in film production. He's magic with all his near impossible camera setups. Scene one, Daryl got into his Porsche and drove off, the camera lingering on a sign for Route 110 East. Scene two, the Porsche pulled into the parking lot of a tacky looking diner called the Red Caboose. Daryl got out of the car, walked across the street, and stood waiting on the sidewalk. Scene three, a heavy set man with thick hair and a bushy mustache joined Daryl on the sidewalk. Daryl and the man exchanged a few words, and then the man handed Daryl a small envelope, which Daryl stuffed in his jeans pocket. Scene 4. Another shot of Daryl in his car, this time passing the high school on Bedford Road. Scene 5. The Porsche turned into a drive. No house was visible from the road, just an intricately scrolled wrought iron fence on each side of the drive. Nancy, Bess, and George go to the diner, where Daryl met his contact in the tape, and learn that the building the man came from is an Air Force defense plant. The plot thickens much like a good stew. They also managed to find the house Jake drove to, and it turns out it's a Russian safe house? Two men point guns at Nancy and she almost runs them over? There's a dramatic car chase where an unmarked van repeatedly rams into the back of Nancy's new Mustang GT convertible. Hope she also got insurance for that. They lose their tail by going and getting pizza. And no, I'm not making that up. The next day is the dance. Nancy is looking sexy as hell. She looked good. She was wearing a dress she'd worn the year before at a university dance with Ned, a soft blue wraparound that hugged her waist and came to a mildly revealing V in the front. That V had put a sparkle in Daryl's eyes. This isn't your grandmother's dance. Hey, Nancy joked. This is a fast dance. I don't think I can move like this. Who wants to move? Daryl whispered in her ear. I know what you mean. Nancy traced his lips with her finger and pretended to be feeling as passionate as Daryl was. 
Let's just stick around a little while longer, though, okay? If we leave now, everybody will know why. So much insinuation. With a sigh, Daryl said, This has to be the best night I've ever had. Touching his lips, Nancy whispered, It could be a whole lot better, though, couldn't it? The touching his lips things, I'm sorry, I just can't help but thinking of when Jake <laughs> did that to Nancy earlier. It, it just can't be sexy now. Maybe Daryl is also feeling the urge to bite into Nancy's finger like it's a baby carrot. Daryl and Nancy go make out in his Porsche, and maybe more. Thinking of what Daryl had done, and might have done, made Nancy pull away. Hey, she said breathlessly, not so fast. There's plenty of time. I know, I know. Daryl was just as breathless. I just love the way you feel. He leaned forward to kiss her. Nancy put her arms around his neck, and when the kiss was over, she decided it was time. I love how she waits till the kiss is over. <laughs> you know, she's got to confront him with this information, but first she's got to get a little sexy, you know? Bringing her lips close to his ear, she whispered softly, I thought you'd like to know. I found out why Jake Webb was killed. Nancy confronts him with her mainly circumstantial evidence, and Daryl is pretty chill about it at first. Nancy asks, Don't you want me to tell you what I found? It's not exactly what I had in mind when we came out here, Daryl said. But if you really want to talk instead of dot 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 doing other things... Then go ahead. Then Daryl kind of freaks out and tries to run, but luckily Ned is there and tackles him to the ground. Then Ned was up, yanking Daryl to his feet. He half dragged him back to the porch and slammed him up against its side. Ned! Nancy had never seen him act so rough. Yes, that's because Ned is the most vanilla. Sorry, Ned said. I tend to get carried away when some killer threatens my girlfriend. Girlfriend! Daryl exclaimed. Then he cried, I'm not a killer! He needs to sort out his priorities. So apparently Daryl was selling top secret military plans to the Russians. Although his father's company losing money is briefly mentioned, it's not tied into this plot point like it is in the game. I think tying Daryl's espionage into his personal family life makes the stakes that much more intense and tightly connected to the story. Instead, in the book, this air defense plot kind of comes out of nowhere and isn't as effective in my opinion. Yes, it was obvious Daryl was hiding something, but there's no way I would have guessed exactly what, unless I'd played the game first. We also discover that it was Mitch Dillon, Daryl's contact, who actually killed Jake after Jake tried to blackmail him as well. You'd think that would be the end, but no! There's still 25 pages to go! Nancy has to confront Mitch Dillon. This is what bothers me about Secrets Can Kill. We never actually really meet the true culprit and killer. He never appears at all in the remastered game, except as a voice on the phone. And he only appears really in one scene in the book, and Nancy spends half of it squatting behind a bush. It feels very cheap and unrewarding. Anyway, the plan is to lay a trap for Dylan. Daryl asks him to meet him at the park, and he's got like a mini cassette under his shirt to record incriminating evidence in their conversation. My favorite part of this scene is that Dylan makes sure to feed the ducks before he goes over and talks to Daryl. Even murderers can be wholesome. The conversation between Dylan and Daryl is interrupted by a flash from a bush, and no, I don't mean there's a flasher hiding in the bush. It's Brenda Carlton, who has apparently been following Nancy, also squatting behind a bush with her camera. Obviously, this upsets Dylan, and he threatens Brenda with a gun. Nancy tackles him, but the gun goes off, and he shoots Daryl in the shoulder, and for a moment, I thought we were going to get, like, a dramatic, redemptive death scene, but no, he's fine. Fast forward to the next morning. Principal Parton meets with Nancy again. Your father told me you were first rate, he said, beaming at her. I'm glad I listened to him. I mean, a, a kid died. Yeah, maybe Nancy eventually solved the mystery, but it would have been nice to do it with no collateral damage. I wouldn't exactly call it a first rate job. Hal's taking the SATs again. Walt decided to bench himself for a while, and Connie's agreed to get some help for her shoplifting problem. Brenda gets her story, 
and the novel ends with a diabetes-inducing scene between Nancy and Ned. In terms of differences, what stands out to me the most, even more so than whatever they did to Daryl's beautiful sexy face, is the character's motivations. Her interactive did a great job of fleshing out their motives and making them more believable. Because stealing steroids from a drugstore in order to enhance your performance to impress a football scout so that you can get a college scholarship is much more pressing than, oh dear, I hurt myself a bit but I'm going to keep calm and carry on. Carrying the football across the touchdown line. Or whatever it is, I, I don't know football. <laughs> Nancy herself feels very different between the book and the game, as you probably noticed. In the games, Nancy is very much a square, albeit a square who occasionally breaks the rules. And she would probably gasp at how often her book counterpart's actions border on naughtiness and promiscuity. I think the tonal differences just indicate how much her interactive has done with the character. They use the Nancy Drew files as a jumping off point. The original Secrets Can Kill game is a lot closer to the vibe of the book, with guns, drugs, and murder. But if you think of the series as a whole, it's evolved from that original vibe. It's very rare to see heavier themes handled by the games nowadays. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Her interactive took inspiration from the Files series, but over time they made the character and the series their own. There were also a lot more cars than I was expecting. Like a bullet from a gun, she arrived on the scene. A young detective who doesn't know the meaning of fear. 